to Revelation 3, 1 through 6. This is piece 5 of our seven piece puzzle of the churches in Revelation in the city now of Sardis. So I'm going to show you just a few. So Sardis, again, I think it was like 35 miles uh, south of Thyatira. We're kind of making a loop from Patmos to Ephesus, up to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, now Sardis. Sardis, um, when I was there, it's a really, really neat site. There's a ton of history there. Um, this is actually part of the marketplace, so you would have had some of these... Uh, these squares here are not homes, they were actually shops. You can keep going through there. The next one, this is kind of neat, that this, there's a plaque here. This was, uh, would have been, obviously, a Christian dye maker or pen, uh, paint maker. So those would have been his uh, uh, bins for his paints and dyes. In Sardis, there is a very large ancient synagogue. I, I read in one place that it was one of the biggest, if not the largest, synagogue outside of Palestine. So, again, these, this is part of the synagogue. Some of the floor mosaics in the synagogue. What's interesting is you'll see this table, and I think the next picture, um, just to think about, well, not quite, that's still, that's still a picture through the synagogue. I think I read one place that it was like almost a football field long. But within the synagogue, would you think about how some of... Uh, there was some marrying of the of the Roman culture. These are actually like Roman symbols within the synagogue, and this wasn't this wasn't the only case, but that would have been like a Roman eagle. This is a largely reconstructed piece. Um, there was a Jewish foundation that that gave money to this because of the synagogue. And it's interesting, the synagogue sat right next to this structure, and this would have been part of the Roman. Uh, gymnasium and baths, but it's a really impressive structure. You can see in the background here, this was the group with, uh, with One Life, um, you can see in the background that part of it is covered with marble. A lot of these buildings, the entire structures would have been covered with like a facade, like a half inch facade of marble. Uh, this is one of the coffins, we would say. They had a very large, ne large necropolis there. Just pause on that for a second. A necropolis was like a cemetery. Um, so it's actually literally city of the dead, necropolis. And they were known for a very, very large necropolis, which is interesting when we read our text. Now this is, a, this is coming into a very large temple to Artemis, or Diana. This temple was worked on, I, I believe, for like centuries and never completed. Um, when they first came to this site, see those two large pillars in the back? Those, they were just, their two large pillars were just standing up out of the ground. And again, they dug all of this down. So you can go to the next picture. This is a tremendous site here. There's actually on the hills on one side and the other, you can still see parts of the walls dating back to like the Persian Empire. It's, it's, it's crazy. These next couple of pictures, I believe... Um, so this building right here is right in the corner of the Temple of Artemis. It's a smaller building, and it's one of the oldest church buildings standing in the world. It dates back to like the 4th century. That proves that I was actually there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, I didn't take this picture. Tim Cody took this picture, and he just said... He said, in the world, but not of it. I just thought, oh, that's so cool, you know. This, this little church right next to this, this uh, pagan temple. Is that all? Um, Sardis has really ancient roots. Um, it pre well predates the Roman Empire. It was the ancient uh, capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. It was later taken by Alexander the Great. Um, and later, the Romans governed... In, uh, beginning in the late 2nd century B.C. It was at the intersection of a lot of trading routes, so there was a lot of commerce, a lot of trade there. Uh, they, they were famous for being the first place to mint coins, to mint gold and silver coins. In A.D. 70, there was a large earthquake, uh, not 70, sorry, that was a different event. A.D. 17, there was a, a large earthquake 
and the whole area was, was really decimated. But the Emperor Tiberius of Rome remitted their taxes for like five years, so they were able to rebuild the city. Century, centuries before the Roman Empire, like I said, this was, this was a capital city, and it was considered impenetrable because of its strategic location and its high walls. Um, but it was, it was taken, and again, I think this is important to our text, it was taken twice by surprise. They just, I mean, and literally, like, armies would surround the city, and it was just like, you could not get in. Um, one, of the, one of the most famous times it was taken, it was actually taken by King Cyrus. So, like, yes, that Cyrus, the Cyrus of the Bible. Um, and what happened is, he had, they had, the, the, uh, the people had retreated within the walls of the city. Cyrus encamped around the city and wasn't able to take the city. But while they were watching the walls, apparently there was one wall that was left really lightly guarded because it was just so steep. And apparently there was a watchman on top of the wall that fell asleep or something like that. And his helmet, this is a true story, his helmet fell down off the wall. So he actually was able to navigate. He scampered down a section of that wall and then retrieved his helmet and scampered back up that section of the wall. Well, there was someone from the, from the army of Cyrus that watched him do that. Oh, he came down this way. Oh, he went up that way. And that is where he set special forces up because it was unguarded and, or lightly guarded. And then they took the city from within. And then a few hundred years later, something very similar happened. They had an unguarded section of wall, this impenetrable penetrable city. And, and the, the army that was surrounding them noticed vultures kept gathering in a certain area. And what was happening is they were throwing some of their dead over this wall, and the vultures were eating the dead. But because of that, that area of the wall, they realized, again, it was totally unguarded. They had men that were able to traverse the wall, get into the city, open the gates from the inside. Um, by the time this letter was written, Sardis was still a proper, uh, prosperous Roman city of commerce, but it was in great decline compared to its former glory. One author uh, commented that Sardis was a peaceful city, but that it was the peace of a man whose dreams are dead and whose mind is asleep. The peace of lethargy and evasion. So that's how he described the city itself of Sardis. So we'll see if Ephesus taught us that the Christian church must be a place of love. And Smyrna taught us that it must be long-suffering. Pergamum, that it must be a place of God's truth. Thyatira, that it must, must uphold an ethic of holiness. We just went through that last week. Then I believe Sardis will teach us that the church must be a place of what I'm going to call Holy Spirit-led authenticity. Holy Spirit-led authenticity. So let's read this letter. First six verses of Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being what? Alive. That's the rep. But you are, what? Dead. Dead. Wake up. <clears throat> Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. In a great, I just want to pause. It's only Jesus that can tell something that is dead to wake up. Right? That's, that's what Jesus can do. Nobody else can do that. Oh, you're dead? Wake up. He has the power to do that. Remember, verse 3, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. It does not seem like that's talking about the second coming, but a specific judgment on this church in Sardis. Verse 4, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. 
I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Some of that imagery would have really stood out to them too, and this idea of being dressed in white, because they were known for their wool industry. Um, so as usual, Jesus begins by emphasizing parts of the original vision we have in Revelation chapter 1, in his glorified self, this beautiful but just overwhelming, overwhelmingly majestic vision of Christ. Here he holds the seven stars and now holds the seven spirits. Um, those spirits are mentioned in chapter 1 verse 4 and they are seen there before God's throne. In, in chapter 1, verse 20, Jesus says very clearly that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, we went over this prior that an angel, that word simply means what? Messenger, messenger right? So the word angel means messenger. So there's, there's a couple of uh, ways that this can be interpreted. It, it can literally mean, and we've gone over this before, that this is a specific angelic being assigned to each church, or it may be a way of representing a leader in each church, a human leader, that was entrusted with the message of the letter. So he holds those stars in his hand. Now here, he also says he holds the seven spirits in his hand. And now there's a couple possibilities. you got to say, well, what, what, is, what are those seven spirits? Now, one possibility is that this is referring to created spiritual beings in which God has granted a high status in His kingdom. And this wouldn't be unprecedented. We see throughout the Scripture uh, several examples of created spiritual beings of varying rank, of varying authority, um, some that we likely incorrectly always generalize as angels. We think of all created spiritual beings as angels, but those are messengers. Um, and, and we see them throughout Scripture having various, uh, as, I, as I said, rank, authority, and access to God's throne. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, and this is by far the most prominent concept among biblical scholars uh, today, is that this is a unique description of, of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, for in the phrase in the Greek could be rendered the sevenfold spirit. Now, the word spirit in the Bible is a really interesting one. Anybody want to know why? I mean, there might be more than one reason. But why is, it, why is it a bit of a challenge when we come to the word spirit in the Bible? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so... The, the word spirit, it, 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 you'll notice in the English, in your English translations, at times the word spirit is lowercase, right? And at times it's capitalized. So when the word spirit is capitalized in your Bible, that re represents the Holy Spirit of the living God. We would say the third person of the, tr of the Trinity, right? Um, but then there's other times that it's lowercase, and that would represent something else. That could represent the spirit of a person. That could represent another created spiritual being in the heavenlies. The, the, the challenge is, is that both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, those words are the same, whether it's denoting deity or the created. You following me? So it's true that way in the Hebrew, it's the same word, whether it's speaking of the divine or the created, and it's the same in the Greek, whether it's speaking of the divine or the created. And so what you have to do, and what Bible scholars and interpreters have to do, is they have to figure out which they're speaking of in the, by the context, right? They have to say, what is the context speaking of? And that's why sometimes you'll see a cross-reference in your Bible where it'll be a lowercase, and, it'll, and the cross-reference will just say, spirit, uppercase, because there might be a little bit of, of mystery there. So that's the interesting thing about this word spirit. And, and in both the Hebrew and the Greek, they both literally mean what? Wind or breath. Wind or breath. So why would this Holy Spirit be called the seven-fold spirit? It would not mean, and remember that Revelation is incredibly metaphorical, 
It would not mean that, that the Holy Spirit is literally plural. What it's, it would be speaking of, if this is the case, that this is the Spirit, it would be speaking of the representation of what we, call the, we could call the perfection of His manifestations. And I say perfection because, again, that number seven is the number of completion, the number of perfection. So the perfection of His manifestations. And here many point to Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, and that's kind of what this diagram is here too. Um, you see a menorah, but it's, it's referring to what we find in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And it reads like this, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Who is that? It's talking about Jesus, right? So Jesse was the father of David, King David. The Messiah would come in the line of David. So a shoot would come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now listen to this. The Spirit, capital S, of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of power. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. All right, so a lot of people refer to this idea of the, the seven perfect manifestations of the Holy Spirit of God, and that could be one strong possibility of what's being referred to here. You follow me? Clear as mud? Okay. So, for those who follow the church calendar, it's already been mentioned that today is what? Pentecost Sunday. So, it's this, so this is, i got to admit, I'm like a little goosebump in it today. Like maybe, because it's like, when God makes connections, like people aren't looking at my notes, you know, and like and people, it, it just, I, I trust that God is bringing things together even this morning. So today is the celebration of Pentecost Sunday, the, the celebration of, now that was a Jewish uh, feast celebration uh, where, where tons of people would come into Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit of God fell on this little band of followers of Jesus after the Lord had died and resurrection and, asc and ascended. And the Lord's like, hey, you wait. You go and you wait for the counselor to come to you. And he did. He came like a rushing wind through this place and tongues of fire, uh, what looked like, he said tongues of fire, came upon each person in the room and it was like they were transformed with power. That is, that is a prophecy being fulfilled that God would pour out his Holy Spirit on his people during this age of the church in a way like never ever before. I think what's really interesting is if this is really a reference to the Spirit of the living God, the sevenfold Spirit, then Jesus is already cluing us in right from the start at both what we might call the problem at Sardis and the solution for Sardis. For, for Romans 8.2 says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of life. The Spirit of life. Um, when Jesus gives his I know statement, right, each letter, I know, I know, I know, I know where you live, I know your deeds, I know your afflictions. Here he says again, I know your deeds, but he knows what no one else perceives, right? He says you have a reputation. This is what you're known for. This is the name that you have. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. The church of Sardis is not what it seems, right? The church of Sardis has a phony reputation. I have just like that picture. You guys got, if you can see, he's got paper clips. Oh, hold this smile. Now, certainly a, a good reputation is of value, right? Um, but the problem is that it too often comes from outward appearances, right? It comes from outward appearances. This is one of the problems of social media. You can, you know, someone can present an image on Facebook or Instagram or whatever else there is anymore. Um, what else is there? Snapchat. Snapchat, Twitter, I don't know. So they, they can present an image, but that's not necessarily who they actually are. Right? So, you know, I want to present this image. I'm so happy. I'm so successful. I'm so whatever. Look at my pictures and I only show you the best of my life. Right? So you can build this image and this reputation on social media to be something that really doesn't show who you are. So, God told Samuel. I do have this in my notes, Abby. God told Samuel, 
go to Jesse's house and go, you're going to, the next king, you know, Saul is going to be done, the next king is going to come from Jesse's family, and Saul, and Samuel comes up, the prophet, and he's checking out these big studs, and he's like, whoa, he'd be a good king, whoa, he'd be a good king, look at him, look at him, look at him, and David's out, you know, the little scrawny young guy with the sheep, and this has already been read, 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, the Lord, this is the Lord speaking, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It very well may be, too, that Sardis was kind of buying into their own press. Right? So if someone tells you, oh man, you're doing great. Oh, Keep, keep up, you're, you're such a success. You know, people eventually, they get that reputation, they can start believing their own press. I believe it was actually Plato, the Greek philosopher, who coined the phrase, the worst of all deceptions is self-deception. The worst of all deceptions is self-deception. An old commentator named W. Boyd Carpenter said, self-satisfaction which springs up when a certain reputation has been acquired, is the very road to self-deception. Self-satisfaction. Ah, oh, look how good I'm doing. Look how well I'm doing. Which springs up when a certain reputation has been acquired. Oh, look at the legacy I'm building. It's the very road to self-deception. This church seemed alive. That's what all the other churches apparently would have even thought of them. Maybe they had a great worship band. Maybe they had like a smoke machine going every once in a while. I don't know, you know. They had the bass guitar and the, the, drum, the full set of drums with the guy behind the glass. And, you know, they, you know their, their children's ministries is, is really well organized. And they have dynamic speakers. And everybody, every single person plugged into a small group. But Jesus says, I see what no one sees. It's like, I really see what's going on. And you're dead. It's like the Pharisees, right? Like, like whitewashed tombs, he said, which are, look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones. And again, he's telling this to this church in the city that had this huge necropolis, this huge city of the dead. Beautiful, ornate tombs full of dead men's bones. Whether they realize it or not, they're phonies, and they're fakes, and they're hypocrites, which means actors, right? Play actors on a religious stage. John Stott says it is form without prayer, reputation without reality, outward appearance without inward integrity, show without life. Like the people Paul spoke of in 2 Timothy 3.5, who would have a form of godliness, but deny its power. They were a church where most, even though Jesus speaks of a, of a remnant, a faithful remnant. And I believe that even, again, it's always that remnant that can stir up the life of the Spirit of the living God within a church. They, it, it, most of the church had soiled their clothes. It would have been this picture of, of sinful defilement. E even in the pagan cultures, you didn't go into the pagan temples with soiled clothes. You had to have clean robes. They were a church of incomplete deeds. Right? He says, I know uh, your deeds are incomplete. They're, we might say they're a church of half measures. I'll do just enough for the show. But I thought, can you really half love? Can, can you really half pray? Can you half worship? Can, can you half obey? Can you half persevere? Can you half be faithful? Your deeds are incomplete. You're, 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 you're people of half measures. Isaiah 29, 13. These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
It may be that they, they were, again, reflecting their surroundings. They were, they were fish in water, and they, they, they were mirroring the city that was living in past glories. Well, we were really good back then, and now the machine is created and it continues to run. John Phillips says, every church is born in some time of the Holy Spirit's moving. Right, so that's interesting. Every church is born in some time of the Holy Spirit's moving. But eventually, the movement becomes a monument. Wow. The movement becomes a monument. Oh, look at what we've done. Look at what we've created. He says it's replaced with a more formal, ritualistic, traditionalized, stereotyped, and complacent form of activity. We also don't hear of any persecution in Sardis. I mean, so many of the other churches, like, they're being persecuted. Even when they're struggling with heresy within the church and false teachers, like, there's this pressure for all around that, that, they're, that, that they're, some are even persecuted unto death. But Sardis, all is peaceful. Were they a church more concerned about blending in than shining the light of Jesus? Was it that their faith and their witness had become so nominal that there was nothing to persecute? One commentator wrote that the church of Sardis set herself the task of avoiding hardship by pursuing a policy based on convenience, and circumspection, that is extreme caution, rather than wholehearted zeal. Leon Morris writes, the temptation for the shelter is always to take things easy, and they readily become slack. But they appeared alive! doesn't matter if it's not what you are. Right? What you appear, don't you sometimes get tired of just appearing? What you appear doesn't matter if it's not what you are. And you might fool everybody. You might even deceive yourself. But you're not fooling Jesus. For Sardis, if things didn't change, Jesus says he's going to come upon that church like the past invaders of that sleepy city, like a thief in the night. And that church would see their lampstand removed. But listen, that's not what Jesus wants. <laughs> he wouldn't be writing the letter warning them if that's what he wants. He wants them to repent. He wants them to change, to turn. Again, W. Boyd Carpenter says, formal tenacity of truth, and listen to this phrase, and a fruitless, inactive regret. So let me say that again. Formal tenacity of truth and a fruitless, inactive regret are alike useless. There must be a sorrow which shows itself in action. A repentance whereby sin is forsaken. So Jesus charges them and he sums it up with two concise words. He says, wake up! Isaiah 42.3 says, A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. But listen, a smoldering wick... If left by itself, it's going to burn out itself. Right? It needs to be fanned into flame. And I love, you know, this theme of the Spirit of the living God and the wind blowing through here. Paul wrote to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.6, he says, Fan into flame the gift of God. Jesus says to this church, Strengthen what remains. Remember what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. Right? Fruitless, inactive regret. Fruitless, inactive regret. How many people live there? Fruitless, inactive regret. Fruitless, inactive regret. Rather than a sorrow which shows itself in action. 
Remember what you've received and heard. Obey it and repent. What did they receive? They had received the gospel. They had received the teaching, the instruction of the apostles. And they had received the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of life. John Stott says that through the Holy Spirit, a stale church can be refreshed. A sleepy church awakened. A weak church strengthened. And a dead church made alive. Could it be that this Christian community of Sardis was going through the motions? But that they were neglecting and they were quenching and they were grieving the person, the divine person of the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and power, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I always love, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd this way because I grew up in the 80s. I love Keith Green. I always love his song. And it's simple. But it's this simple song where he pleads with the Holy Spirit. And he calls him rushing wind. He says, rushing wind blow through this temple. Blowing out the dust within. Come and breathe your breath upon me. I've been born again. Holy Spirit, I surrender. Take me where you want to go. Plant me by your living water. Plant me deep so I can grow. God isn't looking for a group of people who go through religious motions. In, in fact, it seems like that... <coughs> That is something that God cannot stand. God is looking to raise a group of people spiritually to life. And to transform them and lead them by the power of His Holy Spirit. According to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, according to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to the message of Jesus Christ. That, you know, you remember on Pentecost, again, that, that scared little huddle of people, when the Holy Spirit of the living God came upon them, all of a sudden they were bursting out those doors in truth and power and sharing the message of Jesus Christ. I think Jesus is saying, according to the Spirit, wake up, aren't you tired of play acting? Aren't you tired of being an actor on a religious stage? And, and you're, you're, you're drowsy, you're falling asleep, you're actually dying. He's like, wake up and live for me. Like, really live for me. Wake up and trade those filthy garments. Take the garment of Christ's righteousness. Be covered by Him. Washed clean by His blood. Wait, wake up and forsake your phony reputation and your phony name. It doesn't mean anything. It is not what you are. So that according to God's good grace by the blood of Jesus Christ, when you are before the Father, you will hear your name read from His book of life. And that there will be a day that, that the Lord says to the overcomer, to the one who perseveres in their faith, who lives in that grace, there will be a day that the Lord will usher you across the face of the angels and bring you to the throne of His Father and He will acknowledge your name because you have acknowledged His. Isn't that beautiful? Ephesians 5.14, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Allow me to pray those lyrics of the song that I mentioned earlier as we close. Rushing wind blow through this temple, blowing out the dust within Come and breathe your breath upon us. We've been born again. Holy Spirit, we surrender. Take us where you want to go. 
Plant us by your living water. Plant us deep so we can grow. We pray this in the name that is above all names, the only name by which men can be saved, in whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given, Jesus the Messiah.